first thing is I inspect natin Philip, no? Yes. So we will do our inspection. So first is we take note of the anterior chest. We take at the we look at the for any abnormal or we check for any visible pulsations or any visible uh, bulging. So there's no visible pulsation, no bulging, but we will check. We will shine the light tangentially. So there's no visible pulsation, no bulging. Apex bit is not appreciated. Okay. Then we check for jugular venous uh, pressure. So tingin tayo sa kaliwa, Philip. Sa kaliwa, yeah. Okay. So we'll check your uh, for any visible pulsation. So we shine the light tangentially again. You see. So there is a visible pulsation that you can see. Okay. Okay. So to measure the JVP, uh, so you can only measure your JVP if there is jugular venous distension. If there is no jugular venous dis distension, you cannot measure your JVP. Uh, so what we do is uh, we place a vertical ruler over the sternal angle of Louis. How do we identify the sternal angle of Louis? We feel for the suprasternal notch and then go down and then take note of a prominence there. This is your sternal angle of Louis. So you place your, or your vertical ruler here. Okay, then Okay, then you place the uh, vertical, the horizontal ruler <coughs> the, in the area where there is the highest point of pulsation. Huh? Okay, so there. point of pulsation okay so it is uh, two centimeter water uh, so the normal JVP is one to three centimeter uh, from the sternal angle of Louis uh, but if you are going to report it from the right atrium we add plus five why plus five because the distance of the right atrium to the anterior chest is five centimeters so the normal if it's coming from the right atrium, the normal is 6 to 8. If it's from the sternal angle of Louis, it is 1 to 3 centimeter water. Huh? Okay, next is we palpate for the different pulses. We start from the carotid artery. So the carotid artery is uh, medial to the sternocleidomastoid muscle. So this is the sternocleidomastoid muscle. So we palpate here using the using the pads of our index and uh, middle finger. Huh? Okay, so here. Huh? Then, here on the other side. So, never palpate it simultaneously together. Huh? Because the carotid artery is the one supplying the brain. So, if you inadvertently uh, press on it, it can cause uh, hypovolemia. It can cause, cause, it can affect the circulation to the brain, and the, the patient can feel dizzy or sometimes collapse. Huh? And also try to pal avoid palpating up, huh? because that is where your carotid sinus is. Huh? Okay. So next is we palpate the brachial artery. So, so uh, and before the brachial artery, we also. Uh, we, and we are already in the carotid artery, so we we'll listen for carotid brewy. Huh? So carotid brewy. So we check the carotid brewy here. So now we And then on the other side. Okay. So brewy is. If you hear a brewy, it is a sign that there is turbulence of flow. Huh? So meaning it can be due to stenosis or atherosclerosis, it can produce a 
shock a glowing sound in the carotid artery huh? so it's like so that's a it's like a murmur huh? so carotid that's a carotid brewery so for our patient there is no carotid brewery appreciated huh? so after the carotid pulse and carotid brewery we check your brachial artery so as I the carotid artery, uh, the, the brachial artery is on the side of the thumb, so we palpate it here. Okay, so we palpate. So we can palpate it simultaneously to check, to compare. So they should be symmetrical, they should be strong, they should be regular. Huh? So, okay, then we check the radial artery. So the radial artery this time is at the side of the thumb. Okay, so it should be strong and bounding. You compare it with the other side. They should be symmetrical. They should be strong and bounding. Huh? And it should be, they should be regular. Huh? So if there is any irregularity, you will describe it either as regularly irregular or irregularly irregular. So when you say regularly irregular, the irregularity occurs in regular intervals. If it's irregularly irregular, the irregularity is there's no pattern. It can happen anytime. Huh? So after the brachial and radial, we check the femoral artery. Huh? So the femoral artery, we will just describe it. So imagine, so it's midpoint in the inguinal ligament. Huh? So from the ascis to the symphysis pubis, mid, midpoint to that, you palpate that is your femoral artery huh? okay next is your popliteal artery so popliteal artery is in the popliteal fossa so you ask the patient to flex the knees and then palpate the popliteal fossa and look for the popliteal artery okay then on the other side so again it should be strong and bounding okay next after the popliteal, you have your posterior tibial artery. So posterior tibial is on the posterior aspect of your median malleolus. So here, so you palpate here. There, I can feel it. Okay, also on the other side, comparing. Okay, so it is posterior to the later, uh, median malleolus. Okay, then lastly is we palpate for the dorsalis pedis. So dorsalis pedis is here. So it's on the side of the big toe. Okay. Okay, huh? so that's your... So that is a very important pulse, especially for diabetics, because if that pulse becomes weak or uh, is gone or is absent it means that the posterior circulation is uh, not good and that's the one that causes the as uh, the uh, the patient to have gangrene and then later on to have ulcer and sometimes there could also also be uh, if it's gangrenous already then it can there can the patient can have amputation will have um, uh, that extremities so it it will tell you the peripheral circulation Huh? Okay, so that's a very important pulse. Okay, so reporting our pulses, so all our pulses, carotid, brachial, radial, femoral, popliteal, posterior tibial, and dorsalis pedis, all of them are uh, strong and bounding. They are symmetrical on both sides and it is, uh, it is regular, regular rhythm. Okay, then we go now to palpation so for palpation so by the way in inspection we say that there is no bulging and no pulsation and there is a dynamic precordium uh, so when you say precordium it is the area above the heart uh, so this area okay so if there is no you don't see any visible pulsation or bulging so it's what we say a dynamic precordium okay then we, we go to palpation so the first is we palpate for the apex bit uh, so we know that the apex bit is in the fifth intercostal space, left mid clavicular line. Uh, so to approximate, we can approximate it, but we can count it also. Uh, we can look for the fifth intercostal. So that's the 
uh, sternal angle of Louis. So if you go laterally, that is your second rib. So below the second rib is your second ICS. So second, third, fourth, and then fifth. Huh? So this is where the fifth intercostal space left mid clavicular line. So we palpate here for the apical B. Uh, sometimes it's also the PMI or point of maximal impulse, uh, but not always. Uh, okay? Okay, so if the pulse is weak and you cannot feel it, the way to better appreciate it is to ask the patient to go to the left lateral the cubitus. Uh, so, punta tayo sa kalawa, feel it. And then, you feel for it. Then, uh, it's stronger. Uh, why? Why? It's because in that maneuver, the, it pushes the heart closer to the chest wall. So the apex beat is better appreciated. Huh? So apex beat is palpable at the fifth intercostal space left in clavicular line. Okay? Next is to check for your uh, lift and hips. For the lift and hips, we check at the, uh, we check, this indicates the presence of a lift or a hip indicates chamber enlargement huh? so we place so we check for rvh and lvh so for the lvh we palpate using the pads of our fingers our index and your middle finger huh? we place it on the apical area at the or the mitral area and see if there is lift when you say lift there is if your fingers go up and down that's the lift huh? So here is the for LVH, uh, or sometimes if there's displaced apex bit, you will appreciate the uh, lift more laterally in the anterior axillary or even in the mid axillary line. Uh, and and you can also for the RVH, we palpate in the lower parasternal line. Uh, at the lower parasternal line, you can feel it here for the lift. Uh, so. If there's a lift, you will appreciate it here. Like that. Huh? Now, some can do it uh, for faster. You can place your hands here. Okay? If you feel the lift here, that's LVH. If you feel the lift here at the back, that's RVH. Huh? Then you can also appreciate, try also to feel for lift in the aortic and pulmonic area huh? to check for aortic dilatation or if there is pulmonic uh, pulmonic enlargement uh, pulmonic artery enlargement uh, pulmonic enlargement okay okay so that's for your uh, palpation huh? now next is for your auscultation huh? so for for auscultation so first is we identify the valvular areas, uh, the five valvular areas. The five valvular areas is, so again, a reference point is the sternal angle of Louis. So go laterally. Okay, so that's the second rib. So down below the second rib is your second ICS. So the aortic area is on the second intercostal space, right parasternal line. Okay, the opposite that is your pulmonic area which is in the second ICS left parasternal line. Then you have your tricuspid, which is on the fourth to fifth intercostal space left parasternal line or on the left lower parasternal area. Huh? Then in between the pulmonic and your tricuspid is what we call your herbs point, which is on the third ICS left parasternal line. And finally, your mitral area is in the fifth intercostal space left mid clavicular line okay so what we do is we will listen now using our bed our, our diaphragm first to listen to your s1 and s2 so you start from the base my suggestion is you can either do it both ways you can start from the base going to the apex or from apex going to the base but i prefer to use start at the base and then end up in the apex and then once in the apex you count the heart rate in that area. Huh? And the process that we use is we call it inching. 
Why is it called inching? Because you move inch by inch from the base going to the apex. Huh? So then after using the diaphragm, you listen for you use the bell to listen also. Okay? So this is how you do it. Huh? So I your tip. Okay? So listen this time. When you are listening to the heart sounds, you tell the patient to take a normal breath. Huh? Do not take a deep breath because what you're going to hear is the heart the breath sounds. So you have to ask the patient to uh, breathe normally. Huh? So hinga nor normal lang na hinga. So I your tip. Good morning. Right car speed. I mean herbs point, this is herbs point, not uh, tricuspid, so pulmonic and then herbs point. Then you have your tricuspid. And then you have your mitral area. Huh? Okay, then once at the mitral area, you can count the heart rate, full minute. Huh? So do not be tempted to count. 30, 15 seconds and then multiply it by 4. You have to count it in a full minute, especially if the heart rate is irregular. Okay? Take note of the rate. The normal rate is 60 to 100. That's the normal rate. Anything below 60 is bradycardia. Anything 100 and above is tachycardia. Okay? And then take note of the rhythm. Is it regular or is it irregularly irregular or regularly irregular? Okay? Then after... Uh, checking the uh, using the bell, the diaphragm, you also check for you use the bell. This time, uh, so our report there is for the diaphragm. For you would say that S1 is louder than S2 at the apex. S2 is louder than S1 at the base. Why is that so? Because S1. Why is S1 louder at the apex? Because it, the S1 is produced by the closure of your AV valves. Your your tricuspid and mitral valve. Huh? While your, your your S2 is due to the closure of your semilunar valves, your aortic and your pulmonic valve. Okay? So that's why S2 is louder at the base. Okay? That, then, we follow it up by listening using the bell. So as I as when we use the bell, make sure that the hole is open. The opening is, is uh, open. Huh? Then, again, you do inch by inch but you just place it on top huh? do not push in okay. so do not push in because the moment you push in the bell becomes a uh, becomes a diaphragm huh? Then you also listen for S3 and S4. S3 and S4, we use your your bell because your S3 and S4 are low frequency sounds. We listen at the mitral and tricuspid area for S3 and S4. So listen. Then you also try to listen if there is splitting of your S2. Splitting of S2, you listen at the tricuspid area and then ask the patient to take a deep breath. Huh? So there should be splitting. At the, there, should, there can be, uh, the splitting can happen during inspiration. Huh? So that is your, what you call your physiologic splitting of your S2. Huh? And then, of course, there are other types. There is your fixed splitting, which is happens both in inspiration and expiration. There is paradoxical splitting, wherein the splitting happens in the, during expiration. Huh? Okay, then after that, you also try to listen for murmurs. You go to the different valvular areas to listen for murmurs. Huh? Okay, so listen for murmurs. When you are inching uh, during your using your diaphragm and the uh, bell, you are also listening for murmurs already. Uh, then, if you have murmurs, uh, uh, it is 
it means that there's also turbulence that flow. You have to describe what is the uh, you describe the quality of the murmur, whether 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 it's uh, whether it's rumbling, it is blowing murmur. Huh? What is the timing, whether it's systolic or diastolic? What is the pitch? Is it high pitch, low pitch? Does it radiate? Huh? Uh, does it radiate to the back? Does it radiate to the epigastric area? Huh? Does it? Is it affected by inspiration? Is it a uh, is it uh, accentuated by inspiration and uh, you grade it huh? so grade so 4 over 6 uh, and and below and higher 4 over 6 5 over 6 6 over 6 it is a murmur which comes together with a thrill huh? so the presence of a thrill a thrill is a palpable murmur if you if you elicited a, a thrill by palpation it means that your murmur is a very strong murmur Okay? Okay, that's it.